let's make a start. I'm Peter Hunter, Director of ABI, and my pleasure to welcome you all here for this um, talk about an application of medical technologies. Just for health and safety messages, there's uh, toilets, which I'm sure people know, just outside of the right, or in fact there's other ones around to the left. Um, and in the event of any emergency, collect outside. It's pretty obvious how to get outside. Um, so I just wanted to say um, welcome to these MedTech talks for the ABI. And we have a special privilege tonight of having um, Amy, who's Amy Hogan, who's going to talk to you in a minute about what it's like to live with CP. But then we have three speakers from the ABI who are involved in various aspects of research. Um, Steph, I think, is talking next, and then Jeff, and then Julie. Um, so, and then questions as we go, or at the end, after after each talk, or after each talk. Okay. So, my pleasure to hand over to Amy to. Talk. <coughs> Good. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. So I like to joke that I am a bit of a hybrid in the sense that I live with CP, but I'm also a researcher, so I, I alternate between the two spheres of reality. And um, so the, the topic of this talk today is a, is a brighter future for cerebral palsy, and that was what, what on the, was on the advertisement. But I, we, as the Cerebral Palsy Society, are in the position of we want to make a brighter present and a brighter future for our members with cerebral palsy and the cerebral palsy community in general. So what we, what we like to do is level the playing field around what does it mean to live with CP and how do you live well with this very complex condition. Um, and as one of my doctors joked when he was um, examining me one day is that having cerebral palsy isn't really having one condition, it's about having 16 conditions together and um, ju just for fun, making, making that the instruction manual for cerebral palsy is in a language that nobody really speaks anymore and you're deciphering it from the pretty diagrams, um, which is, I think in a way, is a nice description of CP sometimes because it is a collection of symptoms under this very unhelpful label of cerebral palsy. You can, when you live with CP, you can have a, an extremely mild experience or you can have quite a severe experience. And even within those categories, it can change, for, it can change from day to day and you can have a milder form of a severe form of CP or you can have a severe form of a mild. And why I, what I, why I always like to support initiatives like this one is because you, there are aspects of CP where you can make a meaningful difference. There may or, there may or may not be well known about or well publicised because people, when you say you live with CP, people are like, the worst thing ever must be that you are in a wheelchair. And it's like, I like to argue that the best thing ever is to be in a wheelchair when you have my level of CP because you can get from A to B. I can walk around this campus fine, but the thing is, I don't want to be turning 50 shades of blue by the time I get there to do anything. So being in a wheelchair is cool and fun, but the, because it enabled me to get from A to B. And what the Cerebral Palsy Society, we're in the middle of doing our fundraiser for, for the Cerebral Palsy Society for our different initiatives, is that we want to look at the different aspects of living with CP and leveling the playing field. So we have programs like um, Get Structured, where we help our families to get a legal, legal world in place for their child who has a disability. Or we have a get physical program where, in which we enable our members to have their selection of gym or physical program so that they're able to um, have a contribution towards the fees. We have a youth development program looking at what is it like to be a young person with, a, with cerebral palsy and how do you best bridge that gap between childhood and adulthood in terms of getting a job, moving out of home, um, 
stop stop splurging on your parents' Netflix account and actually figure out how to how to afford your own Netflix account. Uh, the dilemma of modern uh, modern youth time, um, and we're we're just in the process of developing and expanding an advocacy program for looking at how to lobby the government and the ministries for more funding for physical disabilities, because physical disabilities is one of the most under upper, underrepresented um, funding initiatives in terms of initiatives for different, initiatives for change, what these, these guys are going to talk about. So we're doing a whole bunch of um, new, and, new and fun initiatives. So if you want to hear about our fundraising campaign and how you can support our fundraising, just hit me up. Um, look me up on Facebook if you want. You'll just find boring photos of my dog my rescue turtle and my garden. So I'm not that interesting to follow on Facebook, but look me up and ask questions um, about uh, September, cerebral palsy, and any combination thereof. Uh, any questions, comments, queries? <clears throat> I think we'll be taking um, questions at the end of um, everyone's talk. So, um, all right, all right. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming and showing keen interest in learning more about uh, cerebral palsy and the research that's going on in this space. My name's Steph, and I'm a PhD student at the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. Um, and the main focus of my project is to investigate the mechanisms of muscle degeneration and cerebral palsy. And I do this work alongside Kelly Virgilio, Justin Fernandez, and Jeffrey Hansfeld. <coughs> so mainly what I want you to take away from this talk tonight is a basic understanding of the importance of muscle regeneration in cerebral palsy, and also a greater understanding of cerebral palsy itself. Um, so I'm going to start with an overview before I kind of dive in to look at the muscle environment and how we can use computational modelling to understand the process of regeneration in both typically developing um, and cerebral palsy muscle. So when I talk about cerebral palsy, I'm referring to a group of permanent disorders that affect uh, movement and posture. And most of you already know that it is a neuromusculoskeletal disorder that is um, caused by a, a brain lesion around the time of birth. It is also the most common cause of physical disability in childhood, um, with a rate of about two to three per thousand live births. And the most common form of cerebral palsy is spastic cerebral palsy. So spasticity occurs when you get an imbalance between the excitatory and inhibitory inputs going to the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord. Um, this causes an overactive stretch reflex and leads to um, the muscle becoming more rigid. Unfortunately, treatment options also um, can weaken the muscle over time. So because cerebral palsy, the effects of cerebral palsy are present early in infancy and throughout the lifetime of the individual, we really need to consider research into new interventions um, that can help with understanding the process of muscle uh, degeneration, that can help with the well-being and the development and the family well-being. Um, so some of the common outcomes in the mus muscles of individuals with cerebral palsy include a decrease in the muscle volume and a decrease in the joint range of motion. In order to help you understand um, how these changes <coughs> might go about, come about, um, I have a short clip that shows some of the various components of the muscle environment and how they behave um, during movement. So from there we can start. Skeletal muscles are responsible for the voluntary movement of the body. They are composed of fascicles containing multiple muscle fibers where each represents a single cell. 
individual myofibers are covered by a basement membrane, which is continuous with the endomycium connective tissue layer. Peeling away the basement membrane reveals myofibers and the skeletal muscle stem cells, also known as satellite cells, which play a critical role in muscle fiber repair. Peeling away the sarcolemma membrane of the myofiber reveals the intracellular components, including myonuclei, that originate from the fusion of hundreds of myoblasts. The myosin and actin contractile apparatus gives us the ability to move in a controlled manner. Um, so that video kind of showed the various um, cellular interactions that go on in the muscle and some of the changes that I mentioned earlier at the level of the whole muscle may be explained by cellular level alterations. So here we have a diagram that illustrates some of the key differences between typically developing and cerebral palsy muscle. Um, so if I were to take a small cross section of muscle, um, what I would find is uh, the fibers, the satellite cells, and the extracellular matrix and connective tissue around those fibers. Um, in cerebral palsy muscle, it has actually been shown that there's up to 70% decrease in the number of satellite cells present, um, a decrease in the fibre diameter, as well an as an increase in the intercellular, intercellular space between the fibres. Um, and this is also shown when we uh, stain and image tissue for laminin, which is more abundant in the cerebral palsy muscle, and that suggests that excess collagen is present um, and leads to that fibrosis that we're talking about, um, which causes the muscle to become more rigid. So some of these pathological changes might actually occur due to alterations in the process of muscle regeneration. So to give you some context, um, I have a short video of the role of satellite stem cells in the process of muscle regeneration. Minor trauma events are common in the human body. Following damage to the muscle fiber, nearby quiescent muscle stem cells are prompted to activate and dislodge from their niche. After cell division, the resulting daughter myoblasts differentiate, then fuse with the damaged myofiber and restore its integrity. Right, so that kind of highlighted um, that the process of muscle regeneration actually occurs at the level of the myofiber and its surrounding environment. And to give you some more detail on the process of muscle regeneration, I have this um, illustration here. And so following injury, um, typical regeneration occurs over 28 days um, in three main stages. And the first stage is um, clearance of the damaged tissue and inflammation. And this is followed by uh, satellite cell activation um, and repair. And these satellite cells differentiate fuse to form the myofibers. The third stage is, um, involves the fusion of the satellite cells into the myofibers as well as the extracellular matrix remodeling which is done by the fibroblasts. However, in cerebral palsy, um, it is thought that there are changes at three um, main points in this process. Firstly, during inflammation, where there is a prolonged inflammatory period or um, impaired clearance of the damaged tissue. Secondly, during satellite cell activation, as I mentioned, there's up to a 70% decrease in these. And also, the remaining satellite cells may not be differentiating um, due to the chem chemical environment. Um, and thirdly, during this fibrotic switch phase, um, where there are overactive fibroblasts which deposit excess um, collagen and lead to fibrosis. So in order to investigate these changes and how they come about, um, we have been using a technique called agent-based modelling. <coughs> so um, to, ex to explain this technique to you, I've used the example of um, a flock of birds. So some of you may have seen um, starling memorations in real life or in videos. Um, but it just so happens that what happens in nature is an excellent way of explaining, uh, of explaining that when you model the, an individual agent, what you can get is the emergent behavior um, when you put them all together. So here's a clip for those of you who haven't seen this phenomenon. 
So in the 1930s, it was actually suggested that perhaps this behaviour comes about by these birds having some sort of telepathic powers. Um, but what looks like a choreographed performance is actually the result of each of these, oh, it can actually be best described by each of these individual birds acting as agents and following three simple rules. So the starlings flocking behaviour um, and three simple rules. Firstly, they need to perform collision avoidance. Uh, so don't crash into your immediate neighbours. Uh, secondly, there's velocity matching. Try to go the same speed as your immediate neighbours. And thirdly, cohesion. So try to stay as close together as possible with your immediate neighbours. So these birds abide by these three rules in that particular order, um, with that order of priority. And what you get is this emergent uh, phenomena that is <clears throat> that can be best modelled. So here's the model that we um, that was created, and here's what happens in nature. And that's the best way that they can explain it. So we've been using agent-based modelling as a tool to investigate emergent behaviour from cellular interactions from a system. Um, and this is during muscle regeneration. So what we do is we take um, a cross-section of the muscle and we lay it out um, in 2D space and then we have our agents being each of the cell types or cell populations in the muscle. So these agents interact with each other and with the environment. And the agents can be like the stem cells and the fibres that I mentioned earlier. Um, this technique also incorporates an element of randomness or stochasticity. Um, that's what gives it the potential to give rise to um, emergent phenomena. So it also positions it as a really useful tool when we're looking at cell population level bio, uh, biology. And in this case, we've been using it to study various hypotheses related to the process of muscle degeneration and cerebral palsy. So here's a simple, um, simplified explanation of what some of the agents in our model do. Um, firstly, macrophages come in and they sense um, that damage has occurred via chemical signals and they clear away the damaged tissue. Then satellite cells come in, they fuse and different, uh, proliferate to form the myofibers. And then finally, fibroblasts come in and they repair the extracellular matrix. Um, the agents in our current model include the muscle fibres, extracellular matrix, fibroblasts, growth factors, macrophages and satellite cells. Um, and these can, these can be modelled by translating their cellular pathways into what we call state charts. So a simple example of this is um, when you take a satellite cell, it will first ask, has damage occurred? If there's no damage that's occurring, it's not going to migrate. Um, if it has migrated, it will then say, is this the right chemical environment for me to differentiate and fuse to form a myofibre? Um, so that's the kind of rules that we're looking at. Um, I have a short simulation so you can visualise what's going on. Uh, so you can see the 2D cross-section laid out here. Um, and this is comparing healthy regeneration to increased injury um, with fewer satellite cells present. present. So over time you can see the colourful dots which are agents and they work to kind of repair the tissue um, in the healthy scenario, you get pretty good repair um, with the fiber diameters. And the, with increased injury, you get less repair um, and less active agents working. Yeah. So we built an agent-based model um, that simulates muscle regeneration over 28 days and 17 fibers. Um, and you can see that over time, so in day one to three, we have the damage that's occurring in red. So we first apply 20% damage and then 40% damage um, to the total fibre count, and we use the endpoint um, number of fibres to measure how much regeneration has occurred. Um, so yeah, the damage occurring in red, and then in the yellow macrophages come in and they clear away the damaged tissue. Um, and then from day five onwards, you kind of get the satellite cells and fibroblasts um, working away to repair the fibres and the extracellular matrix respectively to a pre-injury state. Um, and with this model, we were really interested in the interplay between fibroblasts and satellite cells for their roles in depositing the extracellular matrix and repairing the fibres respectively. 
Um, so we first used this to look at um, how the magnitude of injury and satellite cell concentration affects muscle recovery. So on the y-axis we have the fibre count and then we have on the x-axis over time and we did this over 28 days. So the different coloured lines represent the sat number of satellite cells per fibre um, and w during the 20% or single injury what we saw that was that the level of recovery scaled with the number of satellite cells present on fibres. And when you have mid to control levels, 0 0.12, 0 0.18 and 0 0.24 um, satellite cells per fibre, you actually get regeneration beyond the original count. And that suggests that some hypertrophy was occurring. Um, when we doubled the initial injury, the level of recovery still scaled with the number of satellite cells per fibre, but what we notice is that um, all levels of regeneration are impaired um, at all satellite cell concentrations. So we then went to look at the extracellular matrix, um, and the repair of the extracellular matrix is due to um, the activity of fibroblasts. Um, and Again, we have the extracellular matrix count on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And so reflective of the um, kind of competitive nature between the satellite cells and the fibroblasts, we found that the extracellular matrix recovery was greatest when there were fewer satellite stem cells present. Um, and also, at, so at zero uh, satellite cells and at 0 0.06 satellite cells, we get repair beyond that original number. And then we doubled the injury um, and looked at the same thing, and we found that at all concentrations, the, uh, the extracellular matrix count was beyond the original. Um, and this might be somewhat representative of what's going on in cerebral palsy muscle, where you have weakened muscle um, that's more rigid and undergoes loading, which causes damage, um, but is unable to regenerate back to a pre-injury state before it undergoes another round of damage, and that leads to the fibrosis. Um, so in order to add to this model, we wanted to simulate um, muscle contraction, so we've created a finite element model, or comp another computational model that indicates the location of mechanical, mechanical damage in the muscle. Um, so again, we take that to uh, the muscle cross section and we extrude it out to create volumes and then we mesh it um, into a 3D finite element model. And what we hope to do is take the input from that mechanical, that mechanical input and put it into our agent-based model, which means that the cells will know where the damage is occurring the most and they'll change their behaviour based on that information. Um, and then at the end of that regeneration cycle in the agent-based model, we'll feed that back into the finite element model um, and hopefully show the progression of disease um, with, within the skeletal muscles over time. So we've been using agent-based model to agent-based modelling to kind of investigate and understand the pathophysiology of muscle degeneration and cerebral palsy. And this will help to connect the kind of mechanistic changes to the muscle adaptations that we see in the cerebral palsy muscle. And it'll also help to um, form more targeted experimental lab work as well as um, more tangible pathways towards um, therapeutic interventions. Cool. So before I finish my talk I'd like to acknowledge all of these people who helped me um, with the project and also um, thanks to the Robertson Foundation for funding the project and the ABI and the organisers of the seminar um, and thank you all for listening.
Yeah, so I'm aware of the kind of um, less organisation of the sarcomeres, but I haven't planned to implement that in my model um, yet, yeah. Because there seems to be an interesting interplay between the extracellular matrix, you mentioned more people mm. tissue, that's going to change the mechanical environment of those skeletal muscle, uh, the contractile elements, which then can give rise to further regeneration, right? There's this kind of cascading spiral, and I'm just wondering how that ties into what we know at a more macro scale in terms of the sarcomere lens, and, and maybe if you have some plans of, of investigating that. Um, yeah, I think, <laughs> I haven't, yeah, so we're focusing on just trying to get that, um, so it's, we're just trying to focus on getting that progression of the disease, looking at that first, um, and then whatever kind of comes out of the agent-based model um, out of that, then we'll look into the pathways, yeah. Um, so I just have a, I guess, a thought on that point. That's, that's, a, really, that's a really great question uh, from Tor. Um, so I don't think really all that much is known physiologically about why sarcomeres lengthen in cerebral palsy. Um, it's just phenomenologically known that it happens. And so one way, the step just and I actually just today were talking about the implementation of the model. So you could just sort of stepwise implement that into the mechanical model, just longer sarcomeres, which I think is a really good idea. In terms of understanding the cause of <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. If it just so happens that we implement a set of rules and that's what comes out at the end, then we have some mecha mechanisms to look into. Yeah. Um, I'm a parent of someone just called me. This is all. <laughs> I'm way over my head. But is the original injury, because obviously it's a neurological thing, so mm -hmm. it's the original injury as a result of the brain not being able to control the muscles correctly and that's what starts this like, <coughs> infl um, inflammatory process and it just right. takes from that. So like, where is the original injury that then makes that all not happen? Right, so there are um, both neural components that contribute to the changes in the muscles, um, but there's also non-neural aspects which we don't quite understand. Um, so that's what we're trying to investigate and how um, loading affects the muscle over time. So um, think like exercise-induced contra um, contraction kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, we're looking at the muscle environment um, by itself at the moment. Yeah. So just the fact that it doesn't get worked out supposed to from basically the second, not necessarily the second nipple, but because that process doesn't happen organically how what typically happens, that's what you, what your hypothesis is the reason why this process happens. Um, I don't quite understand. You can say for lack of neural input. Yeah, like I'm just trying to understand how the neural... Right. Like how yeah, so that's, how that's a, more related. Yeah, that's definitely a part of it, but um, we're also looking at the non-neural aspects. So the stuff um, that's going on just in the muscle um, and how that's contributing to its damage over time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so typically um, we injure our muscles um, by exercise and loading all the time and we're able to regenerate that. Um, it's, pretty robust, it's a pretty robust system, um, whereas in CP we see that there's, the muscle is degenerating over time in some cases. Right, um, so we see the model based on the information from the literature um, and possibly you could uh, seed and validate by experimental work as well. Um, so we start from the bottom, so very simple rules um, such as damage has occurred, move to that 
location and then we build up from there to the level of complexity that we need to kind of um, represent what's happening. Yeah. Amy? I did have a comment on, um, on my reading on the whole the, what the CP and the muscle of CP look like from a sort of like a parent perspective. From, from what I understand, it's a bit, it's a bit of a cycle and it seems that the, the muscle starts out in a sort of weak way because it's being moved by a mechanically abnormal you're, you're at a higher risk of being injured more times. The injury recovery is less. So the effectiveness is less at all stages of the, the muscle recovery process and the muscle movement process. So that's why, that's why um, people with CP tend to start at a bit of a deficit model, which is what, what, what they're starting at, looking at into where exactly they can intervene at different stages of because we, um, the metaphor that I sometimes use is that we're, we're, people are typically developing startup here and they're just sort of doing everyday sort of activity. We're sort of starting from down here and making our way all the way up here before we even start the walking process yeah. or whatever process. So it's a, it's a, um, it's start, it's, in the traditional sport sense of the word, it's a handicap before you start the, start the everyday movement, which is why this kind of stuff is really exciting because we're, we're breaking it down into the component parts of how we can intervene to make the muscle healthier and stronger and more robust to this constant theory of injury. All right, thanks for that, Amy. <laughs> it's a great explanation. Yeah. Any other questions? In that case, let's move on with you. All right. Um, so thanks for everyone. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Decently well in the back. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna go um, without the mic because I think there's good acoustics here. Um, so, um, so the title of my talk uh, today is Understanding Muscle Architecture and Function in Children with Cerebral Palsy. So a lot of this is work that I started um, years ago and have kind of built on um, in my time here at um, the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. Um, and a lot of the work that I've uh, done involves uh, MRI so we can actually look at the muscles in um, kids and adults with cerebral palsy um, and make uh, sort of computational models of the, the muscle structure and living, breathing uh, people. Um, and when I say muscle architecture, uh, that's just a term we use to sort of talk about how the muscle is, uh, say, built, or the arrangement of the, of the fibers, the size, the shape, and the orientation of the muscle. And that's really important for the muscle function. And so that's why, why we care so much about it. Um, so just sort of a quick background uh, about me. When I give talks like this, people often wonder um, what strange part of New Zealand I'm from where people have American accents. And um, so I am, I am American. I've been here now for four and a half years. Um, but I started out, I, I went to, um, did my undergraduate degrees in, uh, at East Carolina University in North Carolina. Um, and I studied physics and mathematics um, purely out of interest. I thought physics and, and math seemed pretty cool. Um, and I was also on the swim team as a competitive swimmer. And I found myself often thinking about the physics and the mathematics of how you know, athletes worked and how your body moved how muscles uh, contracted. And uh, getting a bachelor's degree in physics didn't, didn't teach me all the answers, and I was still pretty curious. Um, I also actually spent a lot of time doing outreach to, to people with, um, with disabilities. Um, and that, it sort of uh, continued to, to pique my interest in terms of you know, how do the muscles work, and then when there's something not going so well, what's, what's going on uh, in the muscles. Um, and so uh, I kind of fell into a, a job um, right after undergrad doing um, cancer treatment for radiotherapy um, at the, the Leo Jenkins Cancer Center here because um, I really wanted to apply physics and math to helping people. And I thought maybe this is, is, this is the way. Um, so anyway, I had some issues with what I was doing. It didn't seem like I was really being all that helpful. You can ask me questions later about why that was. Um, 
But so I pretty quickly decided that I wanted to go uh, to graduate school and study this thing called biomedical engineering that I'd only just heard about. Um, and so I wound up going to the University of Virginia and, um, and studying at the multi-scale muscle mechanics lab with um, Sylvia Blemker. And so um, she's the one that sort of introduced me to using MRI to make these uh, lower limb muscle models like you see here. And so these are uh, a model, a computational geometrical model of a real person's uh, muscle anatomy. Um, and so I thought that was pretty cool that you could essentially look inside of a person's, uh, you know, under their skin and make this really detailed model using, you know, computational modeling techniques uh, and, and what their muscles looked like. Uh, and so from that, I, I worked briefly for a startup company that was um, based on my PhD work doing that and trying to, um, you know, trying to have some kind of impact for athletes and for people with disabilities. And I realized the name of the company, and rest assured, I'm an All Blacks fan. I didn't choose the name. That's just what they called it. Um, and then uh, eventually, uh, after a short stint there, I came to um, the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. Um, I was really lucky to get a postdoctoral fellowship from the Whitaker Foundation. Um, and so that brought me here to work with the people that I work with now. Um, and so it's been really great to uh, sort of expand a lot of these techniques and learn from um, some really smart people here in, in Auckland um, doing bioengineering. Um, so cerebral palsy, so uh, many people here know that it's, uh, we call it a neuromusculoskeletal disorder, um, but what does that even mean? Is it neural or musculoskeletal? And, and one of the questions to Steph actually was on this point exactly. Um, so it is neuromuscular, right? It starts with um, a lesion in the central nervous system, but it, it causes muscle weakness, it causes impaired gait, um, there's a lot of manif different manifestations in the musculoskeletal system um, that are secondary to that, that neural lesion. Um, so I have this video, so this is, this is actually slowed down, but this shows a, a typical um, gait. This is an Aquinas gait, so the person can't um, fully extend their knee uh, when they're walking. Um, you also see this, so um, to someone that knows muscle anatomy really well, when you look at this lower limb, you think, ah, that looks pretty, it's pretty small. That looks smaller than, than typical. Um, but there was a time when a lot of analysis into the muscles of the lower limb just hadn't been conducted in kids with cerebral palsy. So um, some people uh, said, oh, it seems like kids with cerebral palsy are a little bit weaker than their typical counterparts, but that's just because they're smaller in size, and so they're probably as strong as they need to be. Uh, and other people said, no, it's not that they're, uh, it's not that they're weaker, it's actually that they're stronger, and they're, you know, they're too strong, they're just co-contracting, which means contracting their muscles on both sides of the joint at all times. Um, and so without actually looking into that question, there's, there are a, lo there's a, a lot of debate and, and misunderstanding. Um, a second thing I wanted to point out about cerebral palsy is it's an umbrella diagnosis, is one way that we put it. Um, so there are a lot of different man manifestations of CP, as Amy pointed out, and they're all categorized as cerebral palsy. Um, and so kind of tied to that is this heterogeneity. So a lot of people with this diagnosis, they have different symptoms. Um, they, it'll manifest in a different way. They'll have a different um, gait impairment. And so um, I'll, I'm, I'll bring that up again, but I, I think it's really important when we're studying these disorders and analyzing them and using engineering techniques that we take into consideration the nature of, of the disorder. <clears throat> and so then lastly, what I wanted to point out, and this is something that's motivated a lot of my work, is that there's sort of this paradox um, that occurs in cerebral palsy, which is that um, the neural lesion that, that causes uh, CP is non-progressive. And everyone for 50 years who studied uh, CP says, yeah, it's a, it's a non-progressive neural lesion, but you see the musculoskeletal effects worsening over time. And so if the neural impairment is not changing, it's, it's static, what you get when you're born or shortly after birth is what you have for life, then why do you see this, um, you know, over time the, the, the gait is worsening and the musculoskeletal effects are worsening. And so, um, so I put together this figure um, some time ago actually because I was trying to think about and, and make sense of what was going on in cerebral palsy. And so you have this neural lesion which is the cause of the disease and that neural lesion leads to gait impairments. Um, it also leads to altered muscle development. Um, mechanically, because you've got gait impairments and altered muscle development, those things will actually lead to one another. And so it's sort of a which came first, the chicken or the egg. And, and no one really knows the answer to that question. And, and probably the answer is that it's cyclical. Um, that continues. Both of these things will lead to skeletal malformation. So um, you have uh, uh, some abnormalities with the skeleton that um, oftentimes orthopedic surgeons will fix with, say, like a femoral um, derotation osteotomy as a surgery. 
And so if you have uh, common skeletal malformations, you can undo those with surgical corrections. So that's good. So that, that won't feed back to gait impairments and altered muscle development. But when you think about it in this, this whole way, you have this really cyclical process um, that's difficult to untangle. It's difficult to understand where the progression of the disease is coming from when, you, when all of these things are interacting. Um, and so I thought, well, what we need to do is we need to start using models and kind of the best techniques that we have to understand um, these things kind of in combination. And so uh, we can use models, mechanical models like the ones I've shown here to understand um, impaired movement. We can use MRI to probe the muscle structure. And maybe through a combination of these things and using other computational models, we can start to tease out what's going on in the musculoskeletal system that's causing the progression. Um, and so a long time ago, um, I, when I was using MRI to look at muscle structure, um, I was doing this in typical people. And um, basically, we did this big study uh, where no one had looked using MRI at the, the muscle structure in, in typical people. So we did this in, in 24 people using advanced MRI. Um, we determined muscle volume. So this is a, a typical um, scan that, that we would get uh, that's a cross-section of the thigh. And so we would identify all of the individual muscles in that cross-section. And we would do this slice by slice by slice. And this was a long time ago before we had a lot of um, automatic techniques. So it was a really painstaking process. But in doing this, we could build this uh, model of, of the leg, of the lower limb anatomy. And then we started asking questions like, um, well, people are different sizes. Uh, you know, People have different masses and different heights. Is there sort of a scaling that exists where if you know the size of a person, you can estimate um, how big their, their muscles are? And again, these, these are in people who are all healthy and fit and active. And the answer is, um, yeah, it's actually pretty good. We get a really a good linear relationship between um, the size of the person, essentially, and the total lower limb muscle volume. Um, so that gave me this idea that, well, if we know how much muscle a person is supposed to have because of this relationship, then if someone doesn't have the right amount of muscle, then we can actually quantify that. We can quantify if someone is uh, down here instead of up here. And, um, and we can give numbers to that. And so in a population like cerebral palsy, then we could basically put kids in a, in a scanner, in an MRI scanner, and we could compute the volumes of all of the uh, muscles in their lower limb, and we could compare it to our typical population and get a, a really robust sense of, of what was going on in their, in their limbs. Um, so, we, uh, so we did that study. Uh, we um, wanted to create subject-specific muscles from MRI scans. Um, but the other thing that was really important to me in this study was that um, when we looked at kids with cerebral palsy, we knew, we knew that it was this umbrella diagnosis, and we'd be bringing in kids that had different manifestations of the disease, uh, you know, different gait impairments. And if we took all the data and we just lumped it all together and did uh, like a statistical test between typical and cerebral palsy, maybe we'd see a difference, maybe we wouldn't. Maybe one person in that study for one muscle would be abnormal and some others wouldn't be abnormal. And I, I thought a lot about this, about you know, how do we look at every kid that we've included in our study, and how do we look at every individual muscle and, do, and uh, speak to statistical significance on a muscle by muscle and a subject by sub subject basis. And so um, the answer that we used uh, is uh, Z-scores or Z-scores if you're from North America. And um, so a Z-score basically says, uh, are you within the 95% range of the data? So this is just a bell curve uh, for, um, for uh, demonstration purposes. But if you're uh, within plus or minus two standard deviations of the, of the mean, then that's 95% of the data. So if you're outside of that, um, then, then it's abnormal and it's significantly abnormal. And it's the same way that if you get a blood test at the doctors, they can tell you if you're within the 95% normal range or if you're outside of that. And you're just one sample, but they can still speak to significance. Um, so I did that, and um, so I made, these, I made these lower limb muscle models, and this is a typical uh, person, a control subject, and so uh, I've color coded all of their muscles by whether it's uh, within or outside of that minus two to plus two standard deviations. And so, as you'd expect, the typical subject, all of the muscles are in that normal 95% range. We start to look at kids with cerebral palsy, and two things jump out. And the first one is that uh, you see muscles that are outside of that 95% confidence interval. So they're signif significantly abnormal. They're significantly smaller in this case. The second thing is that not all of the muscles are the same color. So that means that you have some muscles that are 
more significantly small than others. And when we started to look at, um, compare the subjects between each other, then we started to see not only is there heterogeneity within a limb, within one person's limb, but then between two subjects you saw heterogeneity. And so this is something that uh, a lot of clinicians have talked about, but then we had quantitative data to, to um, verify that that was true. And when you look at all of the kids in our study that we did, so we had 10, um, 10 kids with cerebral palsy, so these two are um, some of the control, not all, but just showing you as an example. Um, you see a whole lot of different manifestations just based on the lower the muscle volume. So different colors within subjects, um, some uh, muscles that are actually not abnormal. Um, and so this, uh, this gave us a lot of um, kind of new insight into cerebral palsy, what's going on in the muscles, how the, the muscle volumes are manifesting differently um, across people and also within people. Um, and so uh, we could also look at um, the, the total lower limb muscle volume in kids with cerebral palsy uh, compared to uh, their typical counterparts. And so you can see here that the kids with CP are falling below what we would expect of a, of a typical person, so um, overall less muscle than, uh, than we would expect. Um, it's also stratified by uh, GMFCS level, so this is uh, the severity of uh, the walking um, impairment. Um, so as Amy mentioned, there's, there's different severities. And uh, basically, the most severe person was the, uh, the lowest on this, uh, on this plot. And then uh, the, the least severe people were actually sort of within the range of what we'd expect of normal. Um, on average, there's about a 20% deficit in um, total lower limb muscle volume in kids with cerebral palsy. So I, the, I think there's some physiotherapists here tonight, because that's been a question for a long time of whether you should do strength training in kids with cerebral palsy. And uh, if you can, I think you should, because they, they don't, on average, have this, the, the enough uh, muscle volume to, to be generating healthy movement. Um, okay, so uh, we saw that cerebral palsy expresses as deficits in muscle volume, um, but one of the things that we couldn't say in that study is, um, so if you have a deficit in muscle volume, does that come from a deficit in the length of the muscle, or does that come from a deficit in the cross-sectional area? If you remember back to uh, geometry class, you could take uh, volume and you can compose it into a cross-sectional area and a length. And so if you shrink the length or if you shrink the cross-sectional area, you'd have a smaller volume. Or if you do both, you'd have a smaller volume. So we didn't really know, is it, we're seeing small volumes quantitatively, but is it, is it low length or is it low cross-section? Um, and what's important about that is that if it's a uh, small length, then that implies that there's a reduced range of motion and contraction velocity. And if there's a reduced cross-section, it, impl it implies that um, the maximum force, so the strength, is impaired. So we wanted to basically dial into this. Is it strength, is it range of motion, or is it both? Some combination. <clears throat> and so going a little bit deeper into that idea, um, so uh, with muscle architecture, muscles are not all built the same. Um, so just showing you a cross-section of a muscle will be sort of like this, so um, across the, the muscle uh, belly, this orange line. But the physiological cross-sectional area, as we call it, is basically um, across the muscle fiber direction. And the reason that's important is because it's essentially a metric of how much muscle tissue is, um, is transverse to the, the fiber direction, and that tells you how much force uh, the muscle can generate. So indicates indication of the muscle strength. Um, and so if you had, uh, so this is what we call a parallel fiber muscle. So you've got muscles running the length of the, of, the, of the muscle here. In pennate muscles, you have the muscle fibers running at an angle to the, the orientation of the muscle. And um, the reason that this is important is that if you had, uh, say, a, a typical muscle um, that looked like one or the other, if you reduce the, um, if you reduce the par uh, sorry, if you reduce the length and the cross section in a parallel fiber muscle or in a pennate muscle, um, you don't necessarily, you can't compute the PCSA uh, from that. And so uh, with pennate muscles, which many are, uh, it's really uh, complicated to try to, to intuit this. So you kind of have to look at the muscle fibers directly. So we used uh, a technique called diffusion tensor imaging. Um, and diffusion tensor imaging, um, basically, we, using MRI, we image the uh, diffusion of water in the muscle. And the idea is that um, water is going to diffuse mostly along a muscle fiber. Um, and it's not going to diffuse in, uh, across a muscle fiber very much because um, there's a lot of tissue that's preventing that diffusion. So if we, image, uh, if we do that kind of imaging, then we can get um, voxel by voxel these sort of uh, directions of uh, the muscle tissue directions of diffusion. 
And then using tractography algorithms, we can actually um, compute uh, the direction of uh, the, the muscle fiber um, sort of space by space within the tissue. And so essentially this is a way that we can image not just the muscles in, in a volumetric sense, but we can image the muscle fibers themselves using MRI. So it's a non-invasive way of looking at people's muscle architecture and their muscle fiber orientation. Um, so we did this in kids with cerebral palsy and in uh, their typical counterparts. Um, along the course of this study, we actually uh, realized that uh, the muscle we were studying, the soleus, actually has three characteristic compartments. And so we had to sort of go back to our data and break this up into these three uh, compartments um, that, were, that had some kind of, um, uh, some kind of role in, in the function that we're still um, teasing out. Um, but we did the fiber tracking using the diffusion tensor imaging. And we started to look at, well, if you look at PCSA and CSA in um, the typical kids who are in blue and then the kids with cerebral palsy in red, um, what are the differences here? And so we saw it sort of uh, across the board with, with one exception, and um, definitely on average, that the kids with cerebral palsy had a, a much lower uh, physiological cross-sectional area, so that's the number of fibers in parallel, and they also had a much smaller cross-sectional area. Um, so this is indicating to us that the strength of, of these muscles is impaired. Um, and when we looked at fiber length, we actually found no differences. So a lot of variation, a lot of variance in the fiber lengths um, in, in this muscle. But across all of the different compartments, we saw no differences in fiber lengths. And so here's the, the averages you can see, um, no significant differences. Um, and so as Tor mentioned, I'll just put this uh, schematic up quickly. Um, so this is uh, the sarcomere structure of, uh, of a muscle fiber. And um, so this is something that we couldn't do with DTI, so it's, it's hypothetical. But a few studies have shown that, um, that the sarcomere length, so the length between these structures in muscle, is much longer in kids with cerebral palsy. Uh, compared to, uh, to typical. And so uh, in this schematic, this might be a typically developed muscle that looks like this, and a cerebral palsy muscle looks like this. So um, the sarcomeres might be something like 30% longer, and so over the course of an entire muscle, you actually have fewer sarcomeres in series, so stretched out, um, stretched out uh, muscles. Um, and the reason why that matters is because if you look at the, the force length uh, property of muscle, um, this is the active force relationship, so that's the force at different lengths that you get if you activate your muscle. Uh, and you also have this passive force curve, which means if you don't think about contracting your muscle, but you've, if you still pull on it, you'll still get force out. Um, and when we look at, uh, this is sort of a hypothetical typical person. This is kind of the resting length of the muscle. Uh, and this would be uh, a typical cerebral palsy uh, resting length of the muscle. So uh, I just put here about 30% uh, longer. And so uh, with a 30% longer muscle, then if you increase uh, the sarcomere length by one micron, this is what you would see in a uh, typical muscle, and then this is what you'd see in a cerebral palsy muscle. So this is one explanation of why uh, we see um, spasticity in cerebral palsy is because of this, this relationship and the, the change in sarcomere length. Um, and so, so in this uh, study, we basically um, Using MRI, we, we were trying to get subject-specific uh, models of the lower limbs of kids with cerebral palsy and dial into uh, what are the, the volume impairments muscle by muscle and subject by subject in, um, in uh, kids with this, with, uh, this pathology. Um, and when we, uh, when we only did this in the soleus, um, because this, the DTI technique is really time intensive, um, but in the soleus muscle, we found that um, it wasn't the lengths that were um, hugely different in kids with cerebral palsy, it was the cross-sectional area, so the strength is really impaired. And that's with the caveat that um, we couldn't look at that sarcomere length, and we, we presume that the sarcomere length is probably um, stretched out in the kids with cerebral palsy. Um, and so a few next steps. Um, so Steph uh, gave a nice presentation on the agent-based modeling of muscle regeneration. Um, and so this is sort of taking a stab at, at understanding the musculoskeletal nature of the disease from the cellular level and how we think regeneration is, in, is impaired, um, partly by uh, satellite cell content being impaired and then partly by mechanical uh, mechanical stimulation of the muscles, which is abnormal. And so that uh, mechanically deteriorating the muscle and an inability for it to repair itself fully is uh, leading to two outcomes. So from the same muscle in the beginning, because um, kids with cerebral palsy often have normal muscles when they're, when they're born and when they're young, um, we think it's that, that repair process, which is not neural, 
that repair process is in the, the skeletal muscles themselves is leading to, um, to poor outcomes and to, to changed muscle. Um, and another project that, uh, that I have um, sort of waiting for a, a PhD student to arrive is um, longitudinal imaging and shape modeling of muscles in kids with cerebral palsy. So we're basically going to be uh, imaging kids' muscles over a time course and trying to see how these muscles are changing in time. So as they're aging over the course of 20 months, um, what is happening to the size as well as the shape of the muscle. Um, and um, if, we can, um, if we can get our act together and get all of the imaging planned out, then what we'd really like to do is also look at the, the orientation of the fibers in that same time course and how that's changing. Um, and I'd like to end with uh, a few sort of clinical perspectives. Um, so I think strength training and physiotherapy are always really good um, options for kids with cerebral palsy because I do think a lot of this deterioration is a musculoskeletal effect. And so if we can um, understand the, the disease a lot better and we can get really good, uh, maybe even assistive physiotherapy regimes, then I think we can start to, um, to stop the progression of, of the disease. Um, and then I mentioned pharmaceutical interventions because I think that the work that Steph is, do, uh, is doing is indicating uh, cellular and, and even molecular level manifestations that um, if we can come up with uh, ways of, say, doing satellite cell treatments or fibroblast treatments, we may be able to um, also um, stop some of the progression of the disease. And um, I've shown here, this is a basically infant musculature because here at um, the ABI and the University of Auckland, we're increasingly becoming interested in having opportunities to study musculature in infants. And I think if we can really understand how uh, mus uh, muscles form at that age and um, in cerebral palsy how it's uh, abnormal at that age and how it progresses, then we'll really be on track to, to understand the disease in those early years. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge um, the many people who have helped me with these studies over the years, um, as well as our funders. Um, and especially uh, the volunteers, because we've had a lot of uh, families with kids with cerebral palsy, uh, kids with cerebral palsy, um, and Amy's been really great uh, at the Cerebral Palsy Society helping us and, and giving us um, some, some good perspectives on the work that we're doing. And thanks for your attention. Yeah, so phenomenologically, um, kids with cerebral palsy and people with cerebral palsy that exercise more tend to have uh, better outcomes. And so while exercise does cause more uh, injury, it also will boost uh, things like, um, so hormones, re reparative hormones and, and satellite cells potentially. So that hasn't really been studied in a really thorough way, but um, I think I think it's sort of up to the clinicians to come up with a level that seems, you know, not not crazy. Like they're, you know, maybe not Olympic style weightlifting, yeah. but I, I do think that uh, that doing ex exercise. I don't, I don't think exercise should be shied away from. No, um, so yeah. Like if you were working like to fatigue or just shy of like muscle fatigue, then that's probably okay. I I would guess so. I yeah, but again, yeah, yeah, that yeah, it really hasn't been studied all that much. But um, yeah, you are boosting a lot of these reparative hormones and satellite cells, so I think that's, that's probably where you get the, the payoff. Yeah. Oh, hi, Jeff. <clears throat> um, you showed very nicely that the muscle deficit in CP was very personalized. Yeah. And I also saw some small classifications of those images, um, mm. different types of images. I'm just wondering, did you, did you see whether or not that the associated kinematics with each of those muscle deficits was consistent. I was just wondering, if, is the form function still um, uh, evident in CP as we see in um, Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so the short answer is yes. Uh, sorry, it keeps going black on my screen, but it's still up there. The short answer is yes. So when you um, sort of think 
uh, in, a, in a sort of broad way about what each of these classifications mean, and you look at the muscle deficits, they tend to make sense. Um, when we collected this data, it was a little bit of a convenient sample of people who were coming through the clinic and agreed to come in. So what we never did with this data set was get a, um, a really good uh, sort of kinematic analysis or kinetic analysis of, of those participants. Um, I just had a meeting with Sue Stott last week where she, because she and I have talked about getting those two data sets um, together, um, and it's sort of, we think it might be low-hanging fruit. We think the first, the first group that gets the MRI data and the um, kinetic data together and then does that study, it's pretty exciting. And so we're interested. We need a graduate student and some funding. So if anyone has either of those two things, let us know. But we're, we are really interested because that's, um, yeah, we think it'll be uh, tightly connected. Has anybody done any modeling on the level four of mice? Ah, that's a good question, yeah. Uh, I don't believe so, and the big reason is that um, before a lot of people were doing MRI on people with cerebral palsy, the, um, the thing stopping them is they said, oh, uh, people with cerebral palsy are going to have a really hard time holding still in an MRI scanner, and everyone knows MRIs take like an hour. They take so long. And so our approach to that, well, we don't like being told not to do something, <laughs> one. And two, we had some advanced sequences that we could speed up the collection. So in uh, this study, it took about 20 minutes to get all of that data. Um, uh, so my experience is that kids with GDM FCS levels 1, 2, and 3 have no problem holding still for actually up to 30 minutes. In fact, they're better subjects than our typical kids, <laughs> we found. Um, but yeah, the, because people were so hesitant to even do, you know, GMFCS 1, 2, and 3, the kind of uh, common knowledge or, or whatever is that, you know, people with 4 and 5 or dystonia will have a really hard time staying still in the scanner and so not to go down that road. But we should maybe have a chat if you think, if you think that, it's, that it's worthwhile, we could maybe pursue that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's a good point, and I think <clears throat> to uh, to be totally fair, this is one of the reasons that we really like having physios and interacting with physios because when we do data analysis and we get really um, interested in different sequences and that kind of thing to understand something about the the disease, there are so many other factors out there, right, in terms of um, of treating the whole person. 
Um, we do, uh, so this tonight is biased by three bioengineers presenting, but we do work with um, a handful of people uh, at AUT in sort of neuro rehabilitation, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of the so strength training and the effects that it would have on, or you brought up alignment and you brought up um, kind of neural control. So strength training uh, can have really positive effects on neural control in a sort of an efferent loop. Um, so you, you, know, you think about, well, you activate the muscles neurally and then they get stronger, but by assisting and you know, going through your range of motion, you can actually uh, repair and, and strengthen that, um, that neural loop, right? Um, in terms of alignment, I personally don't know all that much about alignment, um, just based on the nature of my work. Um, so I would defer to the physiotherapist actually on you know, the extent to which that's important in, term, in, in administering the, the strength training. But um, broadly speaking, we, we always like working with clinicians because you have such a different perspective that's, that's important. So if you want to do a study on alignment. <laughs> Mm. because they're not lined up from origin to insertion, so you don't get maximum power out of that muscle. Right, yeah. Smell aligned, and then you get injury, of course. And, um, it just, you, you see it, especially in children, you see they really stand them in their feet, and their feet are rolled into the elbows. Mm. If you alter their weight bearing or physically hold their feet in alignment, suddenly through the interossei and all the muscles of the feet just click into action they all start working in co-contractions and to maintain their balance and standing. First part of to me was absolute magic. It just blew me away and that's when I realised how important alignment is. And this is the point that has a complication of alignment and training to so you, you can learn it in a clinical environment but then try to do it at home as well and try to get that constant feedback of alignment probably you become more aware of it, older with you is, and as you, as a parent starts to take over, and you start to take over, the constant thing to get the alignment, alignment. Yeah. Jeff, Jeff, how much do they, how much do we know about the growth pathways that lead to laying more cycle down in parallel versus in series, and how much mm. can particular exercises influence those types? Because yeah. You, you want to put a lot more in series. Yeah. So in terms of cerebral palsy, uh, and especially with uh, sarcomere serial addition, we, we don't really know a lot. We just know phenomenologically that they, you know, at at some time point um, when kids are around ten, they have fewer sarcomeres in series and they're stretched out. Um, so how that happens and why that happens is is still a mystery. Um, the Sarcomeres in parallel is a lot more known, right? Um, bec just because that, I guess, pathway or understanding um, adding sarcomeres in parallel and strength training is, is better understood. Um, and so Steph's model is mainly based on, on that idea, adding sarcomeres in parallel. Um, but Tor made that point about, about you know, serial sarcomere addition and, and how that's manifesting in CP and, and modeling it. Um, so. I think that some more physiological work and, and also some more modeling would be um, really useful to probe that question. Um, at, at the moment, I don't know where to start on that one, but I, I am interested in it. And I think maybe a, a second model that works more on the serial sarcomeres rather than uh, sarcomeres in parallel, I think would be the way to go. Great question. Okay, all right. Can we thank Tor? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for coming tonight to uh, hear about our research here at ABI. Um, my talk will be quite different from what you heard with uh, Steph and Jeff. Um, so for my talk, I will mostly concentrate on talking about getting um, easier assessment of the pathology of each uh, children, and also how to have more customized treatments, and I mean more patient-specific treatments, other than uh, a one-size-fits-all treatment. Um, 
so my talk will be more concentrating on um, children with cerebral palsy with a GMFCS from one to three, so ambulatory um, children. And it's very important to know that New Zealand is a great country and we love it. It's big in size, but not that many people. And we have about 12,000 um, people with cerebral palsy in New Zealand. And so what that causes is that mainly, if you want to see a specialist and you have CP, you kind of have to come to Auckland and see an orthopedic surgeon or a neurosurgeon. And also in Auckland, you have the Auckland Gate Clinic. And it's the only gate clinic that can assess how um, children uh, walk and move. And in this clinic, um, they have an optical motion capture. And so it's what you see on this picture. It's in a room, and you have lots of cameras. And you put some markers on, on the child. And then you ask this child to walk back and forth. And, and you record how they walk. And that's how you, you assess uh, the level of disability and which um, muscles are affected and how you want them to move uh, better. And that's going to influence the treatment. And, and that's the gold standard. That's the best we can do. But this system is very expensive. And that's why it's only available in Auckland. And it's confined inside a lab. So we're putting all these markers on these children. And you ask them to walk as normal as possible. That, that's not a reality. Um, and then you have to have an expert on site from putting the markers onto the child to then hours of post-processing uh, the data to give it to clinicians. And that, that's just expensive. And so we were looking at a solution for that. Having another system that would be very cheap and that can go outside. And we were thinking about wearable sensors. And they are made of inertial measurement units. And that's basically what you have in your phones. And so if you put one sensor on each segment, so foot, lower leg, thigh, and on the pelvis, then maybe you can get the same range of motion that you have using an optical motion capture. And so that's what we wanted to look at. And so we combine wearable sensors and computer models to try to estimate the range of motion uh, at the ankle, knee, and hip. And so one thing that we need to do is to validate. Can we actually do as good as an optical motion capture system? Right, that is our gold standard. And so we use um, healthy adults for that because it's much uh, easier and ethically easier to, to do. Especially that we, after putting all the markers and the wearable sensors, we ask them to walk on a treadmill, which is not always easy for children. And we asked them to walk for one minute. Why? Because we wanted to make sure that we don't get error over time using our sensors. We wanted to make sure that you can record for a certain amount of time and still have the same results. And then we looked at the hip flexion extension and the knee flexion extension uh, during one gait cycle, which is when you actually heel strike with one foot, then you push up, you swing your leg back to heel strike, and that's a full cycle. All right, so now we're going to go to the results. Um, and so on the top graph, you have the hip flexion extension for one participant over 15 gait cycle. And the bottom graph is the knee flexion extension. Um, in orange, you have the results for using the wearable sensors. And in blue, you have the results with the optical motion capture. So you can see on the bottom graph that we were pretty good estimating the knee flexion extension range of motion. Um, we had a 95% um, reliability um, in capturing what happens at the knee. Unfortunately, we were not that good at the hip. It looks like our wearable sensors doesn't want to go get the hip into extension too much. Um, so there's still work to do, but it looks very promising. And if you think about it, it's like a $10,000 system. It's going to get cheaper and cheaper. And then you can put it into every clinic 
in New Zealand. You can even ask the clinic to rent it to families. And so they can have it at home. You can use it for rehabilitation. And then you can just look at the range of motion of the ankle with um, game exercises or, or anything. And I think there is a lot of things that can be done with this system. So our future work uh, would be to uh, increase the accuracy at the hip joint first. Then we want to add the ankle joint because the ankle joint is very important. And also add the additional plane of motion. I only look, uh, showed the flexion extension, but we also we need to capture the internal external rotation and the various valgus. That's um, future work uh, for, for us at the ABI. So now, we talk, I talked about the wearable sensors, but I want to look also at the computer model. How can we make the computer model better? So our computer model is made of a skeleton, and it replicates the muscle attachments in the lower limbs. Right, and this model is from an open source software. So you can use it, trick it, however you want. This particular model um, was designed from um, measurements made on uh, male cadavers, and so an adult male. And what we do usually with the model and the little balls you see, we, we actually um, scale the model to the height of our new patient. And so for children, where it looks like we nearly shrink our model down, which is not really accurate because we know that children are not small adults. So, so that's one point of error in our model. The other thing we can do, and we do it in research, is you can have medical images of your patient and reconstruct the bones and all the muscles, and you can get a very accurate uh, muscle attachment points, muscle volume, and bone geometry into your model. Unfortunately, this takes a lot of time, a lot of time, which is not feasible for the clinic. I mean, it's it's very good model, and it represents everything you want, but it's just not feasible. So we wanted to see, can we go into the middle, having something that could be as good as subject-specific model, but as quick as just the generic scaling. And we thought, well, what don't we use statistics? And so we thought that we could create an atlas of bones based on the population of children. And so here I'm going to present some results, some, some pilot data that we did from 5 to 11 years. But then we're going to make it much bigger and go from 4 to 18 years of age. And so what we did, we um, had 35 children CT scans. And from this CT scan, we reconstructed the tibia, the femur, and pelvis. And so then we created a sur surface mesh fit. So every tibia had the same mesh, and every femur the same mesh, and every pelvis the same mesh. So we can compare them. And then we had a principal component analysis. What it is, it's like looking at what was the m biggest mode of variation between all these bones, between a 5 and 11 years old, what's the difference in shape of the bone? And that's what we wanted to look like. What's the, where is the variation? And so, as you can expect, the first mode of variation was the size, right? A 5 years old is much smaller than an 11 years old. And so, in this graph, in green, you have the mean shape of the bone from our 35. Uh, scans, and then you have minus two standard deviation and plus two standard deviation. That represents our 95% of our um, set. Then we looked at the second principal component, the second mode of variation. It was actually, as also expected, the, the um, joint width. All right. And then our third mode of variation, where for the tibia, the tibia rotation, for the femur, the antiversion twist, and the pelvic antiversion. And so that gave us an indication on how the bones look different from people to people, from children to children. And I only presented three, but it can go as many as you have um, subjects. And so what we did is we took the results from this principal component analysis with uh, each um, 
person's um, age, gender, height, and weight, and we put all of that into a machine learning algorithm. And then if you have a new patient, it could match with the age, gender, height, and weight, someone from your training set, and it could reconstruct their bone, predict what their bone would look like. And so we wanted to test, well, that, does it work? Can we actually predict? So we, took, we did a leave one out validation where, so we had a total set of 35. We took one out. We trained on a 34 subject, and then we tested on the one we left out. And you can do that for all of them. And what we found is that looking at the point-to-point -point comparison between um, the predicted shape and the reconstructed shape from the CT scan, we had a um, difference, a mean difference of 15 millimeters at the tibia and femur. So it's like 1.5 centimeters. So it's not much. It, it's pretty good. And we had even less at the pelvis. But the error went up to 28 millimeters. And that, that's a little bit too much. We want to reduce that number. And so I looked at what happened there. I looked at the persons. And they were actually all children with a very low BMI or a pretty high BMI. That means that they were not in, in the normal range, if you want. And so we didn't have enough of information for them to predict their bone. So what we're going to do, and actually I got 200 more uh, CT scans of children that we need to reconstruct. And so we're going to increase this, this population-based atlas to 250 um, children from 4 to 18 years old. And you're going to say, well, why, why is it interesting for us and, and children in cerebral palsy, right? Because they're all typically developed children. Well, we want to know if using this, um, this statistical shape model and using some medical images, so I'm thinking about sparse MRI of children with cerebral palsy that have deformed bone, can I actually put it into my machine learning and still get <coughs> reconstruct what their bone would look like. If you can add some, some data, some deformation, maybe we can, we can use the statistical shape model to, to inform clinicians and inform our model so that the bone will be deformed into the model and take into account bone deformation. And so this, this um, future study is, uh, has been granted recently by, the, by HRC. So it's ongoing. Now, um, I, wanna, I wanted to talk a little bit about treatment. And there is different possibilities of, of treatment you can do. One is um, prescribing ankle foot orthosis, right? Because it helps the child to uh, improve their gait mechanics and make it as stable and as normal, if we want, as possible. Um, but as you can see, there is a very, very range of design of ankle foot orthosis, right? It depends on, on, the, on the child. It depends on what you want to do with this child. It depends on do you want to increase the range of motion at the ankle or do you want to actually stabilize the range of motion at the ankle? Or the leaf spring AFO is actually to uh, increase the push-up phase and make it more efficient for children with cerebral palsy. And so depending on the pathology, it will be a different prescription. And they are very important for ambulatory children. It helps them to walk better. It helps them to walk. The, how it's made, on, on the other hand, is very old fashioned, I would say. Um, it's, uh, they do a plaster around the leg of the child. And from that, you create a positive model, and then you thermoform a plastic sheet around this mold, and then you get your AFO. And well, this process is a bit old fashioned, but it actually does not happen in New Zealand, right? They send the mold to the United States and they do their thermoforming over there and then they ship it back here. How efficient, right? It takes some time for the child to actually get their AFO, a growing child. 
uh, not really efficient. So in our today's technology, why don't we use 3D scanning and 3D printing, right? I mean, it's much more efficient and goes much faster. So for 3D scanning, we, we have the option of laser scanner, um, which is a handheld scanner that you go around the leg and you capture the geometry of the foot, right? To get rid of this plaster and molding thing. Um, it has some disadvantages. It takes uh, several minutes where you have to be very stable, not moving. It's a long uh, post-processing and you have to take into account different postures. It, it, it's not that easy. There is a new technique that um, came recently, which is photogrammetry, where you have an object and you take multiple pictures of this, around this object. So you can have one camera and take multiple pictures around, or you have, can have multiple cameras around your object that takes one picture all at the same time. And so if you think about it, it's just one picture, so it's like one second. Only one scanning necessary, and it's a much faster post-processing. So we thought, well, what about we build our own 3D scanner? And so that's the first um, prototype. Right, we're engineers. So it was like clearly cameras around um, here at Mannequin Lake to actually validate our, our 3D scanner. And then I, I collaborated with designer at the um, Victoria University of Wellington. And that's what it looks like now. Um, they made it much more. Um, Nicer for the kids, it's kind of look like a bouncy castle or something, it's actually inflatable. Um, it's <laughs> we, we tried it on, on some kids, they were really happy about it. Um, they were really happy to participate in our research. Um, and so they went inside, they looked, and then I said, well, stay still, I'm gonna take the picture. I took the picture and I said, that's it. And they were very disappointed that there was not <laughs> much more going around. <laughs> it was like, well, that's what we want. We want it to be very fast. Um, and so that's when uh, another project that is going on, uh, and a master's student is actually finishing up uh, on this one. And then talking about 3D printing, uh, we all know the advantages of it. Uh, it's great. The problem is, is the material you use for 3D printing. Um, it, it's not made for um, ankle foot artosis. It, the, the material is way too brittle. So when you taste it and you ask a child to just walk around, yes, it works. If they go around, jump and run, it's gonna break, for sure. It's really not um, sturdy. And so what we need and what we wanna do is actually 3D print with um, carbon fibers, because we all know carbon fibers can make something very resistant. And depending on how you lay your fibers, it can be, the material properties can be very different, and so you can shape your ankle as as you want, and make it as flexible as you want, or as rigid as you want. So printing carbon fibers exist, it's not great now. Um, if you want to do a really good job, it's very expensive. So we're still waiting for the technology to get there, but it is getting here, and, and we will be able to use it and have ankle for artosis much faster than going back and forth with the United States. Um, thank you very much for staying so late tonight and listening to us and for coming. I would like to thank my collaborators that helped me with the work and my founders. Uh, that gave me the money to do the work, and uh, thanks again for coming. Worse, or if at least if they do get worse, they get a little bit worse as opposed to just 
Well, I would love it to be like ready right now. We're still doing some research to, because we want to be accurate, right? And then we need the DHBs to agree. And that's where hopefully it won't be too bad. But that's something that you can buy it. It's commercially available. It's whether the DHBs will buy it or not. At one point, that's going to be the problem. Exactly, but at the same time, they're going to say, well, the motion capture system already exists, so why buy something else? So hopefully, we can, once we have good results, we can do a good case. And I'm working with Sustat and with um, actually the Oakland Gate Clinic uh, physiotherapist, and so hopefully, we can all say that's what we want. They're not very reliable. You can print out a, a photo that's going to go, here's an AFI, go and try it, does it improve it? Yes, no. Chuck it out, because it's not going to last anyway. Yeah. And then you can actually find the perfect one that's going to actually make an improvement to the gate that's then made and covered by that's going to last a year. <laughs> well, they're right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it has to do with the calibration. So with the optical motion capture system, you put, you put your markers at, at the knee and, and you do some calibration at the hip. And so you perfectly know the um, axis of rotation, but you don't have it with the wearable sensors. So you need to do some calibration of some sort. And so we tried squats um, to get the range of motion, flexion, extension, but apparently it didn't do the trick. <laughs> because what we're seeing is that the hip keeps flexed. So we, we're actually losing this extension, hip extension. Um, so we're looking into that. Uh, it, I, it's a matter of um, calibration of the wearable sensors and the axis. No. Julie, thanks, it's really nice to see you all kind of put together. And, and one question or point that kind of gets on to the wearable sensors as well. You know, measuring the joint max is important, the kinetics and that kind of thing. But also equally important is the total load exposure. And this is something even with athletes, for example, we have no idea what the total load exposure is. And given the work we've seen from Steph and Jeff, that that perhaps the regenerative kind of properties are different in these individuals. One really nice aspect, and again, I think this is loading for free, is to use the wearable sensors just to see how active these children are. And I know Sue's tried a little bit of this, just, you know, it's essentially a Fitbit on steroids, right? You know, <laughs> but you want to get more information, and I'm just wondering how much insight we can get, even though you've got a system that's, let's say it's not very accurate, but at least you're measuring what they're doing over an entire day or a series of weeks, you know, what we could glean from that type of information. Because currently, we don't have a good idea of how active these kids are. Now, yeah, if you, you just took one um, of these uh, inertia measurement units and you put it at the ankle, and you can see how much um, force they get onto their body. And then you can see maybe you can put it into a Steph's model and see uh, with more <laughs> more active, maybe there is more regeneration of the cells or vice versa, you never know. That, that could be very interesting, yeah. I have actually been having some studies on Yeah, they're doing the Lidens Institute, yeah. Because yeah. oh. yeah. my, my daughter did that study, well, with the vibration study, and she had a sense of a five-day, and she measured the total load of exposure and how much they were doing. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to kind of make sense because it costs them more energy. No more tired. It's interesting that you've got about three, I don't know how many projects you're working on. And I think of um, Jess, um, who as you said, um, you described architecture, um, uh, um, uh, architecture of the anatomy and um, the architecture, so I'm sorry I'm going to bring you back on with that about alignment, um, the, about the, the architecture of the body and that it's fantastic and I feel like um, to be thinking of a, of a cheaper, faster and hopefully it's about health equity for more children around the country, not, um, that you're thinking about architecture for the lower limb, for the yeah. uh, It's not the only bit of the architecture that needs to be supported though. And I think that there's a lot of, maybe it's like an easy study, I don't know, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist, but easy study to look at the, the muscles of the extremities of the yeah. lower limb and you know, the gait. And, um, but what about the powerhouse of the limbs, which is the trunk, and alignment of the trunk? Trunk makes. If that's not aligned and you don't have a strong core, then it's irrelevant what your legs are doing if this part of your body isn't strong. You're not going to move in a functional, Swing too much. efficient way if the architecture of the trunk is not supporting your heart and your lungs to do the work, to do the walking. Um, and I think that. Um, it would be amazing if it's not necessarily um, carbon fiber supports for the trunk, but looking at orthoses that support dynamic movement as mm. well as supporting the structure of the scaffolding that an AFO survives, provides, the external scaffolding. Mm -hmm. It's something that then allows movement in a three dimensional plane, which an AFO. Yeah. So, uh, are you thinking like braces, like for scoliosis children, or something uh, a little bit of, less? Of dynamic braces, okay. Garments and things that are, you know, we, we're talking about a child that's moving. Well, but before before the walking, there's time that happens before they get walking. Mm -hmm. You've all of the talk today is about stability and how to get them to start early mm -hmm. when this happens, chicken and egg. You know, yeah. they're born with a normal muscle and pretty quickly it's not normal. It's got to start early and supporting early, not yeah. just looking at the gate when it's maybe some stuff that's already happened. It's earlier, yeah. Well, we have some colleague at Exercise Science that is looking at getting um, an early diagnosis because some of them are diagnosed too late. Before she was one, like pediatrician. No, 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 no. They just don't yeah, want to be they, wrong, they. so it's getting past that. That, yeah, that. And that's the other thing that Sue's was more than a CP register. Yeah. And, and Sue and Anna McKean and Shalom about early diagnosis. Yeah, but we need to do early intervention as well, yeah. which is, I think, is missing. Yeah. Um, I have sort of a comment about yeah. trunk alignment on that. Um, and it's with your uh, photogrammetric system. Yeah. Um, so with a system like that, you know, one idea is that you have a clinician who's sort of inspecting alignment, posture, position uh, at the time that they get the, you know, the photograph taken. And so maybe this is a bit of a crazy idea, but uh, if you set up like a harness system with a uh, suspension from overhead, then you could actually dynamically control the posture with that harness system while they're in the photogrammetric system, and then basically uh, you take a photograph of their limb when, once they're in the posture that you want. Is that the blue thing? Yeah. the blue thing, yeah. <laughs> you can design the AFO using uh, 3D design software when they were in the preferred line of the you dynamically go. So more things to build, basically. <laughs> I would love to come on the plane. I think it was a story. So it's uh, sorry. So because that's the other thing, that when they get paid, those now they're not weight Yeah, so that's. The, the the, um, so there's. They're standing in the middle, uh, and the interest was also to um, put some uh, wedges 
to realign but then if you want to realign the track maybe a harness and then yeah once everything is in place just take the picture and uh, um, this is a bit outside, but is there any link between the research that you guys are doing for CP and adult stroke victims? Um, CP is essentially a stroke, okay. but the money that's thrown at stroke victims is massive. I know. And the money that's thrown at CP is practically zippo. And the, like, it's just the whole early intervention gets them to a level where they're going to be functioning society, paying taxes. Like doing all these great things and just being fun, like being able to be active in society, but the money's just not not there. Not there. And I, obviously this is a new office, <laughs> but well, Tor is actually working on stroke patient with uh, Catherine. We're doing it in disguise, actually. We're really interested in CP stroke. We tell the most people that we're actually looking at stroke. <laughs> but this it's just stroke would This uh. Um, stroke patients don't actually have um, specific AFOs, they have off the shelf usually. And something that we could do with 3D printing is actually do it customized for, for stroke. I mean, sometimes when I write a grant, I don't mention CP, I mention um, lower limb disability or, you know, if, if you go into just one category, you're thinking yeah, about. It's just like a health system. There's the whole, the big stroke center that they built. Like at least one in the country. <laughs> just one. <laughs> yeah. But they're just literally not. Yeah, I, I actually heard the, the stroke CP analogy for the first time a few years ago from Marcus King, who does research um, out of Christchurch. And um, you know, one of the things is that the so the insult, the neural insult, is very, very similar between stroke and CP. The difference being CP happens at or near birth where a stroke happens to an adult. And the manifestation of it, so one thing is that stroke does not progress. Musculoskeletal effects are pretty much static, where CP progresses. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we're really interested in studying, at the University of Auckland, in studying uh, pediatric muscle development. Um, because there's something in the developmental phase of pediatrics that's making the manifestation of CP different from the manifestation of stroke. And I, I do second by getting a natural CP center, research center. That'd be great. Oh, yeah. So, three. Yeah. <laughs> anyone in here that can pull those strings in the oh. I'd be on board. Okay. Well, thank you very much again for coming. Thank you. And listening.